Look at the difference of what your jumbo loan would cost you at 3%, which I think you can get a jumbo right now at 2.75 fixed for 30 years. Look at a million dollars at 2.75 versus a million dollars at 7%, which is what rates were when I bought my first house in 2007. You can literally afford two and a half times as much house today than you could just 10 years ago when I bought my first home. How do most agents who don't have access to the secrets that the top agents in our industry hoard to themselves grow and prosper in today's real estate environment? That's the question. And this video podcast is the answer. I'm Pat Hyman, and welcome to Real Estate Rockstars. Real Estate Rockstars, this is Aaron Muchastegui. Hey, today we have something really exciting. We're actually doing a joint podcast recording with my good friend, Jeff Cohn. Jeff runs the Team Building Podcast. I love to tell people Real Estate Rockstars is the best podcast out there for real estate agents. But you know, Jeff may argue with me on that a little bit. Jeff is one of my favorite real estate agents out there. We go way back and I asked him to come on and do the dual state of the market with me today. And so you might be listening to this on your Real Estate Rockstars download. You might be listening to it on your Team Building Podcast download. We're two guys that love real estate. Jeff, how's it going? It's awesome, Aaron. Super excited to be here, man. I appreciate it. Um, what I would say is I started listening to Real Estate Rockstars so long ago when I discovered the difference between you and me were the podcasts we listened to, the books that we read, and the people we spent time with. Aaron and I have a fun story, which we'll save um, here in a couple minutes from now. So stick around to hear how Aaron and I met the very first time on his farm in California. But what I would say is Real Estate Rockstars is going to teach you to be the best real estate agent in your marketplace. It's going to teach you how to serve your clients at the highest level. And then of course, I know we're talking about investing now, which I'd like to talk about that a little bit today when we talk about the state of the market. Um, the team building podcast is just that. It's going to teach you to stop selling real estate. It's going to teach you how to focus on building a business, an entrepreneurial venture beyond just real estate and getting into mortgage, title, insurance, and all the other ancillaries that we believe will run parallel and continue to help the agent be profitable. That is such a great thing to be transitioning into too, because lately we have had so many people on here that I've been saying, Hey, our mission is to help real estate agents succeed. But some of that long-term success becomes, can you also invest? Right? Like the commission you make every month is great, but the, you know, people have learned during COVID and shutdowns that the, yeah. you know, that the tomorrow's income isn't necessarily guaranteed no matter what type of business that you've built. And so some of that other stuff that you've talked about will really help yeah. you know, di diversify. So you're up in uh, Omaha, right? So Omaha, Nebraska. Yep. And Omaha, Nebraska is our market center and my investment team and several of our other operations. Yeah, I remember the, even a couple of months ago, I got to see on, on the big stage at the KW Family Reunion event in front of, I don't know how many tens of thousands of people in there as you were kind of just switching. And you were also one of the smartest guys ever because when, when quarantine started, you were out in Hawaii. And I think you just said, hey, I'm just going to stay here an extra couple of months to see if I can wait yeah, out. Yeah, we, we went minutes. for a week to, we were going to go to Disneyland or Disney World actually in Florida and everything got shut down mid-March. And so I said to my wife, where would be the best place in the world to be stuck for a couple months? And we joked, Hawaii. So we booked one-way tickets. Normally they're about 600 a person. We got them for 200 a person. We yeah. got there before COVID had hit. So nothing had been shut down yet. You didn't have to quarantine yet. Once the quarantine order went into play, we were already there and I was able to negotiate a luxury house that was normally a thousand a night, had a pool, hot tub, six rooms on the beach. We were able to get it for $200 a night and we decided to extend the trip another four weeks. So we were actually six weeks in Kauai. The entire time Nebraska was closed, we were in Hawaii. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Being, getting there before the shutdown, because yeah, I hear the Airbnb is getting well, they, crushed out they, there. They got shut down. So while we were there, an order came in from the governor that all Airbnbs or any rentals for, for that matter were not allowed to rent for a certain duration of time. And then I think it opened up and then I think it's closed again. So it's just been for an anywhere, anywhere, right? This isn't just Hawaii, just anywhere that's tourist. I know Florida and California, as of a couple of days ago, just closed again, depending on when you're listening to this episode. Yeah. Um, no. you know, and we'll see this a lot, I think, across the country. So when we get into like state of the market, I don't think we know yet where it's going to be as this ebbs and flows. But what I'm guessing, and I've speculated from the beginning, is once the next president has been defined, I think that the rioting goes away. I think that COVID goes away. And I think the world gets back to a new normal. But I don't think that we hear as much talk about pandemics and riots. 
Yeah, I saw I saw that yesterday with somebody said like Japan is, uh, you know, just said their state of emergency is over. And the biggest headlines underneath it was, I guess it's not an election year uh, in Japan right now. <laughs> if they're going to That does add to everything. The election yeah. years makes everybody more stressed anyway. Uh, throw this on the top. We are in this crazy pressure cooker of a world. But what about Nebraska? So I'm, I've been telling the listeners about, you know, I'm, yeah. out, I'm in California and Austin and we're like shut down the not now we're shut down. What's it like out in Nebraska? Yeah. You know, it's, and I can speak to Nebraska as well as we have hundreds of coaching clients all over the U S and for the last six months, once a month in one of our high level calls, we'll ask everyone to report on the state of their state. You know, how are things going? Is your, you know, is real estate still essential? Are clients still going out? I will speak to Nebraska first and I'll say, uh, we've all, we've never even been deemed essential. We just have been allowed to show and sell and list. Typically anything in the financial world has stayed open. Entertainment got closed for about two and a half months. Restaurants, of course, delivery only or takeout only. Um, Right now, everything's open. I wouldn't say back to normal. You'll see a lot of people wearing masks. Walmart just changed their rule ruling on masks. I think that was nationwide. So you have to have a mask on in Walmart. You have to have a mask on in Costco. Um, and then it's kind of to each their own in terms of the requirements for masks. Uh, my office came back online soon after I returned from Hawaii when the rule went from 10 people per location to 100 people, which is what it's at, I believe, right now in Nebraska. So you're allowed to have gatherings up to 99 people something like that. So my office doesn't usually have over a hundred people at a time. And so I would say from a real estate standpoint, it's been the hottest market we've ever seen. I predicted while in Hawaii, on probably over 30 webinar interviews and on my podcast that we would see a third quarter in Nebraska that would perform like a second quarter. And we'd see a fourth quarter that performed like a third. I predicted that the, that the whole, the pandemic and everything closing would only last about two to three months. And then things would have to come back online. And exactly what I predicted is what's happened. So people are reporting record months. Agents are reporting record months. People that were worried and wondering what's going to happen, I think, in Nebraska have a comfort now that things are getting back to normal. It's not the doom and gloom that the media might have you subscribe to. And rates are still at an all-time low. So we're seeing homes moving. I saw, I got two sides on a $1.8 million listing a couple of weeks ago. I've had several showings on a $3 million listing, which is really high for Omaha. It might be the only house over $3 million on the I can imagine, market. yeah. Rockstar Nation, this is Aaron Amuchastegui. Hey, I hate to interrupt the current podcast that you're listening to, but I am so excited to share this with you. I just finished interviewing the original host of this podcast, my good friend, Pat Hyben. You know, I got to talk to Pat about how he started his real estate career and a whole bunch of tips and tactics that he used to be successful. So if you haven't listened to it yet, go check out State of the Market number 49. On there, I get to talk to Pat about all those different things. You know, and in there too, he talked a lot about his Six Steps for Seven Figures book and training program that he built over the last couple of years. And I realized I haven't done a good enough job of reminding all of you lately about all of the resources that we've built for you out there. So if you want to check out Pat's course, we've got like a three minute summary video when you go to it. It includes so many easy to follow tips that you can follow on it like a day to day basis. You can email reminders, all sorts of different things that come with that course. You find that you go to rebusuniversity.com, R-E-B-U-S, rebusuniversity.com. Look at courses. You can find the Six Steps for Seven Figures book. And really, there's a whole bunch of other courses in there too. Our normal prices used to be $1,500 or $2,000 a course. These are real deal professional courses. But now uh, during quarantine, a lot of them are priced down to like 90 bucks, 95 bucks. So we've slashed the prices because we know right now is the time for everybody to be focusing on growth and education, especially while they're feeling like they don't have as much to do. And if you go in there and you figure like, like there's a lot of different courses you want, maybe you don't want to buy the a la carte. You can go to futureofrealestatetraining.com and you can get access to all of our different courses for 97 bucks a month. I think there's a discount on there if you go a year or there's even like a lifetime option that you can pay to get access to every course we ever put on Rebus University for as long as we have it. So go check out those options, Rebus University or futureofrealestatetraining.com. All right, back to your podcast. Sorry for the interruption. Um, so we're seeing, seeing every price point move. But the thing I found surprising, Aaron, and now I'll get into our segue of when I came out and visited you. So Clint Bartlett, who's the operator that runs our investment company, Dynamic Properties, that buys about 100 homes a year, single family, primarily. Uh, we wanted to learn how to be the best. And we had heard all the success that Aaron was having in investing and wanted to pick his brain. And I kind of have this pattern of instead of just calling someone and having a 30 minute phone call, I just call and ask if I can visit their house. So yeah. Aaron's like, dude, I live on a ranch, like in the middle of nowhere, in California. And we're like, that's cool. So every time we go somewhere, we find the top three or four people to meet with. So I think you were in Modesto, right? Or the Modesto area? It was the Sacramento area. Yeah. Okay. So we ended up visiting that the trip, Daniel Ramsey, the owner of, um, 
My Outdesk. My Outdesk. Thank you, sir. Aaron and Maddie Aitchison. So yeah. it made for a pretty dang good trip. And I had met all these gentlemen in an organization that I was in for several years called Go Abundance. So that's kind of how I had the foot in the door. But no one really knows each other until you spend a couple of days together. And Aaron had the coolest property, huge pond. He had beehive, a beehive with real honey and chickens. Oh, yeah. And, all sorts of stuff. And I just, you know, I'll say publicly to anyone listening, I think that was really cool that you hosted us. But I will say that one of the patterns that I've seen amongst high producing individuals is that they have an abundant mindset. And while they're happy to get on a 30 minute call, they're also happy to open their home to you. And he literally opened his doors. We entered his house. He didn't know who we were. We sat in his office yeah. and we had a five hour conversation that day. And then we went out and um, that's how relationships are made. So we've done that. I've done that personally. I know Aaron has as well, hundreds of times across the country, across the world. And anything you want to become great at, just pick the person you want to be like when you grow up and go spend time with them. Yeah. And then we all got to go boating afterward. You chose some great people to come hang out with. But Jeff's point there for all of you listeners is really, really good, right? We all, we have an abundant mindset. We are doing these podcasts because we love meeting people. We love sharing ideas and we want everybody to be hugely successful. And he said, Hey, how do we flip houses? It was, you know, when I first started getting into businesses, I was, I was scared to tell people my secrets. And then somewhere along the line, you learn that the more you give, the more that there's a balance and, and the, and you would be amazed if, you know, if there's somebody in your market that you want to meet, or there's somebody out there, that's the best of what they are, pick up the phone and call them and say, Hey, can I come shadow you for a little bit? Whether yeah. it's somebody you listen to on Jeff's podcast or my podcast or anything else, you'd be amazed at how many yeah. people say, yeah. Listen you know, to this, Aaron. When COVID hit, we opened up all of our brokerage training for free to every agent in Omaha. All of the agents in Omaha, Nebraska, across all brokerage flags can attend all of our brokerages trainings online. They never have to enter the office. I don't even need to know who the person is, but I've given them a link so they can actually watch all of our trainings for free. Show me a brokerage that's ever done that. We also open up our office for free. I also talk on my podcast, just like you would, about every strategy for free. The reason why takes me back to a story where my dad and I decided to plant three trees in one of the homes I grew up in when I was in fifth grade. And instead of hiring the company to come with a big digger that pulls a big hole out of the ground, we decided to dig these things by hand. And I don't know the rule. <laughs> Someone's going to call me out. But I remember at the time it had to be like five feet deep and four feet wide. That's the brain of a fifth year old. I don't remember fifth grader. I don't remember in actuality, but I remember in a fifth grader mind thinking it took us 12 hours to dig the hole. What I have found is to get to the level you're at and to get to the level I'm at, it takes that much time, effort, dedication, and consistency over long periods of time to be successful. So if I go download for someone all the things that we've done to become what we are today and share with them where the direction that we're going, most people say, no, thank you. Digging holes isn't for me. And what I would say to you is thank you leave us, give us the space to go do what we do. I know less than 1% of people will ever do it. And I would love for everyone listening right now to prove me wrong. But that's been what I've seen. I'd say, I'd say it's one out of a thousand people that ever truly go and do it at a high level. Yeah. You know, our foreclosure book, our how to buy foreclosures just started pre-selling on bigger pockets. And um, people are like, did you put everything? I put all of my secrets in there because there's two of those things that happen. One, I hope everybody puts me out of business. I hope that, you know, 10,000 people become amazingly successful at doing it. But then two, it's also realizing that not everybody will do the hard work. So let's have an abundant mindset. Let's teach everybody all the secrets. And if you guys hear a secret or something, you know, as we jump into our news, you know, Jeff already talked about it, hottest real estate market kind of anywhere all over the U.S. We have heard everybody is booming. One of the articles in Inman this week, we've been talking about mortgage rates for weeks. As mortgage applications surge as buyers scramble for rates now below 3%. So purchase activity up year over year. How much of, a, of an impact do you feel like mortgage rates are having on it? Do you think it's just people needing to upsize because they live in their house too much now? Or do you think mortgage rates are having a huge impact? You know, I think a lot of the news saying mortgage rates are at an all-time low, anyone that's looking at buying, we never talk about becoming a pre-approved. The dialogue we train on is finding out what your buying power is. It's more of an empowering conversation about what they're able to purchase. Anyone yeah. watching right now, if you ever dreamed of having a, you know, let's say a million dollar ranch with bees and chickens, and you yeah. live in a $200,000 property today, look at the difference of what your jumbo loan would cost you at 3%, which I think you can get a jumbo right now at 2.75 fixed for 30 years. Look at a million dollars at 2.75 versus a million dollars at 7%, which is what rates were when I bought my first house in 2007. You can literally afford two and a half times as much house today than you could just 10 years ago when I bought my first home. Home That changes everything because when people start talking about your market being a seller market and people are paying too much and there's multiple offers, rates are under 3%. 
Who cares? Yeah. All that matters is he locked the property down. Your rates are under 3%, you guys. My, our parents in the late 80s were in the upper 19, 20% range on interest rates. That's like, it is like free money. I mean, inflation itself will be more than that. So if you really start digging into it, you're like the, the you know, the, the, the payment that you're making with the, with the dollar 10 years from now, you know, every thousand dollar payment you make 10 years from now is like 700 in today's money. So it's not just, so it keeps getting, you know, better and better as you get to see that. And I bet, you know, all you agents too, I think there's an analysis you can do in your market and say like, Hey, if you bought a $400,000 house five years ago, that means you could afford an $800,000 house today, same payment. I mean, it's exactly, exactly doing it. what he said. Figure out your algorithm and tell people that on social. So the challenge is finding stuff, man. And like, and this is not Nebraska. We're insulated a little bit by some of the challenges that are being faced with COVID, but that's in the major cities. The problem with the news, if you watch on average, start writing down the names of the cities they're cover- they have coverage on. It's five cities. Well, guess what? A majority of America doesn't live in those five cities. So let's talk about the places people live. So when you look at the Midwest, yeah. right? You look at the South, you know, there's there's certain regions that have not been as impacted. And those regions are on fire right now. The challenge is inventory. People can't find houses. They have they have the money, they have their buying power, they know what they want, but they're not being they're not able to successfully find a house. And that's where construction comes into play. And it was interesting in the recruiting process when Gary Keller was trying to bring this over to Keller Williams last year, we talked about some of the challenges that we were going to see over the next 10 years. And I think this ties in nicely to this our topic today. Gary's belief is that the property management industry is going to see a huge boom due to inflation. People are going to find that just by renting their house out, they'd make way more money you know, than staying in their home. So they'll go and live with friends or live with family or buy a smaller house and they'll rent their house out Airbnb um, or hire a property management company to do it. So that's going to be booming and new construction. No one, they can't build fast enough across the country. You cannot build for the demand that's out there. So the rental market's going to explode. So what I think is going to happen going to the investment conversation, I think we're going to see investment property, double, triple, quadruple, and even is it quintuple? Yeah. What's five? I think we'll see that in our lifetime, Aaron. And when people look back and they have regrets, and I know there's a great book, The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. When it comes to business, everyone listening right now that's part of real estate transactions, either investing or representing others that are buying or selling real estate, your regret will be that you didn't own more rental properties. And the thing that's so fascinating with this is when I chose to get my license, I got licensed in 2006, I had a pattern in my life when I ever wanted to be like someone, I just interviewed people that were like what I wanted to become. And so I interviewed the top 10 agents in Omaha, 2006. I'm 22 years old, newly married, ready to take on the world. Mm -hmm. I would say 99% of the people I talked to when I said, if you could be me, what would you have done differently? And I wanted advice like door knock, start a referral group, you know, call, make prospecting calls. Like I I wanted to know how to sell real estate and make a commission. No one taught me how to sell real estate and make a commission. Everyone said invest in rentals. I wish I had owned more rentals because our parents' generation saw homes starting in the 80s double in value every seven to 10 years and then double again and then double again. And we haven't gotten to experience that now. I think just now it's starting to go again, but I think there's going to be a correction caused both by inflation. There will be inflation in value. And I think we'll see homes that were today, I mean, we've seen this in some cities, but homes today that were 200 go to 400, 400 go to 800, and it'll be impossible to own. And at that point, you're going to have to rent and you're going to be able to make your one or in Omaha, we make a 2% of the value per month in rent. And that's our equation for Clint and I buying about a hundred. You make 2% per, per month out. No, I should buy yeah, some or, Omaha. Uh, don't like, everyone forget what I said. Yeah, you're we're like, at a half of a percent. There's rent control. <laughs> it's a complete nightmare. What's the zip code you're competing <laughs> in, Jeff? No, the, I think you're right. I think everyone's regret will be not, a, you know, I, from 2009 to 2012, I flipped a thousand houses and I lost a bunch of money in 2013. And my biggest regret at that point was, wow, why didn't I buy more rentals when my business was crushing it? Now I own hundreds of rentals. I started buying them in 2015 and I still wish I had more, you know, especially as we go in. And that has been the ultimate thing for me during quarantine. And, you know, so if I usually buy for vacant abandoned foreclosures on the courthouse steps. That has been on moratorium since it started. It just hasn't happened. Yeah. There's been very few things selling uh, at all. And so that part of my business has been completely shut down. But my rentals are people yeah. are paying, so paying let, rent. Let's, let's talk about this. And, and when I get on these podcasts, as we talked about before we jumped on, neither of us are getting paid. We do this to create massive value and influence for others so that you can apply these things. We know most won't. But this is some... This is a part that I love kind of having a back and forth with. And that is when you talk to investors across the country, when I listen to podcasts, when I've been part of several large um, 
investment mastermind groups that meet nationally, uh, everyone talks about flipping and flipping is semantically is what people talk about when they talk about investing. But a delineation I'd like to draw is that flipping generates revenue that Uncle Sam gets to charge you your 42% tax rate on. Flipping is not something that happens when you sleep. Somebody has to actively be operating a flipping business. So what I would challenge everyone to think of to your very point, Aaron, is start taking one fifth of your flips or one fifth of the revenue generated off your flips to buy single family or multifamily or storage units, something that creates residual revenue because that's your retirement money. That's what everybody should be working towards. And what I loved about GoBundance, which was the organization I referenced earlier that Aaron and I were both in, I don't know if Aaron still is or not, But the thing that they talk about is becoming a hundred percenter. And what a hundred percenter meant in the GoBundance organization was that you'd be able to cover 100% of your life expenses to continually maintain your lifestyle. You stay at your CrossFit box, you own your boat, you go on seven trips a year, you have a nice house, all the things you need. Let's say that number's $200,000 a year. If you can generate 200 grand a year without working, that's money coming in off your investments, including rental properties. You can do that. You're a hundred percenter. I don't hear people talk about it, Aaron. I, yeah. I rarely hear millionaires talk about this. Why are we working to work? Go back to the book, The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. No one looks back and says, I wished I had worked more. Hey, Real Estate Rockstars listeners. I am sorry to interrupt again, but I want to do a quick commercial break. But this commercial break is different. This is stuff that I think you need. And this is me talking to you about some of the stuff that we had. So, you know, recently we had a lot of people reach out to us and say, hey, why don't you do a real estate mastermind? Why don't you do something where a lot of the listeners can get together and do some Zoom calls and ask each other the questions and really just try to brainstorm and work together. I mean, there's a million masterminds out there. I don't know if this is something that we really want to do or not, or if we do, if we're going to limit it to maybe 20 or 30 people. We're just trying to figure out if any of you guys are interested. So if you have any interest at all in joining a mastermind with real estate agents around the country that are part of the Real Estate Rockstars Network, go to hybendigital.com forward slash mastermind and just join the wait list. It's just a really a formal, it's just an interest list for us to see, is this something we want to be doing? So that's, that's number one. Number two, you go to hybendigital.com forward slash foreclosures. We have a two day mark thing that we just finished recording. Now it's also inside Rebus University. And so you can go to Rebus University and look at it. If you're already a member of Rebus, I mean, a lot of you guys are in the, you know, the monthly fee where you get access to everything. So we have a new course in there, 17 hours of content on how to buy foreclosures on how to find deals on how to you know do title you know go to auction also turn that into clients for your real estate agents how you can turn somebody that's in default behind on their mortgages into a client so go you know check out that course especially for it you know you can you can buy the course now but again most of you guys already subscribed to all that i just wanted you to know there's another 17 hours of content great great content that i just recorded on there uh, that all of you guys have access to now at rebus university and then finally, the we have software that we talk about on and off. It's called Padhawk. And in Padhawk, you can use that to go find leads. But, uh, you know, so everyone is really, really busy right now. And we're so, so busy. People are selling and they're saying there isn't enough product on the market, right? So they're, they're, they can't find houses. Well, Padhawk will help you find houses before they're listed. It helps you find owners that should be listing their properties or people that might want to get there. I recorded a quick video. It's like six or seven minutes long for you guys to look at real estate agent specific on what, how you can use the software in order to do it. So it goes hybendigital.com forward slash lead. Again, there's a video in there. I talk about how you can use the software to do it. Check it out. If it's something that you like, you may want to sign up for it. 99 bucks a month, but it's nationwide, any city out there. And it is a great way to find houses. So right now people are saying there's lots of buyers, but we can't find enough houses. Well, maybe you can use this software. You'll find somebody that hasn't listed yet and make them an offer on their house. All right. Back to your regularly scheduled program. Thank you for letting me interrupt you with that break. People say, I wish I'd taken the trip to Alaska. I wish I'd spent six weeks in Hawaii. I wish I had done, you know, that little boot boutique store that sold furniture, whatever the case might be. We were, we're here to live and lead the lives of our dreams. Investing is a great vehicle to be able to do it. And I would share with your audience and mine, if you're looking for where to invest your money, everybody has the messaging out there. Learn how to buy single family, multifamily or storage units. That's where the money's going to be over the next 30 years. That's what's going to help you become a millionaire. And if you look at anyone that's become a millionaire, typically real estate is a big part of their portfolio. Yeah. You know, one of the things that Jeff said, I have a lot of people ask me, should I be flipping or should I be renting? And I talked to them that the way we were able to build up is like, yeah, one out of every five flips or one out of every five houses we bought, we would do a flip to make some quick cash and use that to be our down payment to finance the other four that we bought. You know, as agents too, if you're not flipping houses yet, another way you can turn that is you're making, if you're making five or six commissions a month, 
you go, all right, so of my five or six commissions, one of them is going to go toward buying another investment property, or one of them is going to go into this account to be able to buy those investment properties, come up with some long-term goals. Just the, you know, all of you agents listening, well, you know, the, you know, you're, you're operating at a really, really high level, but just remembering that commission is uh, you work for it every month and you guys work hard for your commission every month. You guys are earning every dollar out there. And so just make sure that you put some to the side and why not, it, why not, not it be in real estate where you guys are experts yeah. anyway. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole idea. Um, millionaire real estate agent. I read that pr- uh, 10 years before joining Keller Williams, but it was a book written by Gary Keller in 2005. And it talks all about getting to the seventh level and seventh level. And Gary speak is making a million dollars a year, working less than five hours a week on your business. Who listening right now would want to make a million dollars a year working for less than five hours? Most people laugh and that's not a possibility. And for those that take it that way, it is not a possibility for you. But Aaron and I can confirm we have lots of friends that make over a million dollars a year, 10 X yep. million dollars a year. And they literally don't have to work if they don't want to. So my war cry back when I launched my team and chose to get out of the business, focus on the business was to teach real estate agents. And I'd say the same thing for investors to stop working a job. Flipping homes is a job. It's a function that has to happen every single day. What's the end game to become a hundred percenter? What are you investing in that creates residual wealth? And it can be ancillary businesses. We own a mortgage company, a title company, an insurance company, a digital marketing company, a call center in the Philippines, and a myriad of other businesses that run parallel to real estate. All of those for me are residual because I'm not the operator of any of those businesses. And I teach those that I partner with to not be the operator either. So eventually true leaders serve their followers by teaching them to be just like them, but eventually they will teach their followers to be just like them and and on goes that equation. And what I would want for all of our listeners is to put themselves in a position where you could choose to go spend six weeks in Kauai and your business grows while you're away. You have the choice to not go show that house this weekend. You have the choice to tell that seller to go pound sand when they're being disrespectful to you in your family's time. And that's all I want for everyone is to be empowered to not have to necessarily work in a job, but be able to work on a business. And there's something so invigorating, something so powerful about no Knowing that every hour you put in is giving you the ability to have more hours to do the things you love. Yeah. Well, and sometimes we have to do the hard stuff. We have to do the hard parts in our business that we don't like, but I think that long-term goal would be to get yourself into a position where you don't have to, or you don't have to do it as often, or it doesn't have to be, if you don't like knocking on doors, but it's the only way you're getting deals, you know, hopefully you get yourself set up in a position where that's not the only way after that. You know, before I go into the next article, the, you talk about all these ancillary businesses that you have. If an agent is listening and now they're like hitting these different volume levels and they're selling five houses a month, the, what do you think their first ancillary business that they should consider is? Investing. Investing. So if you're an agent, you should be building an investment team because the pieces for an investment team are very similar to the pieces for a a traditional real estate team and they complement one another. So when you go on an appointment as an agent, you should literally wear, and I have multiple hats here. You should wear two hats. So you show up as a traditional agent. Hey, I'm here to list it at market value, but oh my gosh, your grandma's a hoarder. The house is a pile. It's leaking all over the place. You probably don't want to put this on the market because you're going to need 30 grand just to take it to the MLS. Why don't we partner up with my investment company here in town and we'll make you an investment offer, which typically will be 20 to 30% below market value, but it's going to be a lot less hassle for you. So as an agent, that's the conversation you can always have. And then as an investor, if you're an investor listening and you don't have the traditional arm, stop giving deals to your acquisition manager without charging a referral fee. Stop charging a referral fee, period. Just have an agent that works for your investment company that can take all your traditional real estate transactions and just pay them a salary. So all these leads you're generating, I think Gary Boomershine, who's the owner of um, realestateinvestors.com, they generate over a million leads a month with mailers all across the country. He said 70% of opportunities that come in are traditional opportunities. 70% of the appointments they're going on are traditional. Well, don't lose those deals. Build a residential arm that runs parallel. Number two would be mortgage, but mortgage is very hard, hard to create. And there's lots of legal surrounding mortgage. I think one of the easier ones is insurance. And the way you can structure insurance is literally you can partner with a private independent insurance agency in your state. And so if you've been sending them deals over the last 10 years, I there's an algorithm, go online, do some research, but you've made them hundreds of thousands of dollars. They just haven't told you. So you go to them and say, Hey, I've been your marketing arm essentially for the last five to 10 years. I've given you hundreds of leads. I'd like X percent of your business. If I'm going to continue giving you leads and they're inevitably going to tell you, well, I'm not interested, Aaron, go pound sand. And you'll say, okay, no worries. There's 1000 other independent insurance companies in our city that I can partner with. 
And so I've been able to structure these deals. I did not build companies from the ground up. Legal limited liability companies, they were from the ground up. But the people I partnered with already were working in this space. I had already proven myself to them that I could bring them business. And then I just simply negotiated a percentage of ownership in their business. And my value add was the leads that I'd be able to bring them to. That is, that is some great, it, great advice as, as some quick things to get into. And what you said about, you know, the investment arm being so related to being an agent. What's really cool about adding that ancillary business, it also makes you a better agent. If you get to show up as an agent and say, I'll buy this from you for a hundred thousand or I'll list it for you for 130. Like that's the, that you are helping your client too. You're saying, I'm giving yeah, you you're now giving them the two, lowest. Yeah. I'm giving you two options. I'll, I'll yeah, let you get done right now. Price. Or we'll do with this. And there's there's all sorts of versions there. The whole guaranteed sales program, which is a scam, essentially tells a seller you're guaranteeing you'll buy it if it doesn't sell in a certain amount of time. The price you're buying it at is a ridiculously low price, which is the same price you're going to offer day one. So you essentially have a guaranteed sales program. And what a unique position to put yourself in and the seller to say, hey, if you decide in three months you want to just have a fire sale and get rid of it, I'll buy it at X. But let's take it to market at Y and let's see what the market tells us. Yeah, I love those those deals. So the when we're trying to tell people where to invest, one of these articles that just came out in Bloomberg um, yesterday, uh, day before yesterday, it says New York, LA nightlife lockdowns sending renters to the suburbs. You know, so I've been thinking, I've been talking about this a lot lately. Is that I think that their you know demand for rents in downtown areas will go down. A lot of people say, hey, it'll oh. eventually come back. You know, downtown New York City came back after nine yeah. eleven. You know, but the but what do you what do you think? So do you, if someone's going to invest in rentals, do you think right now it's yeah. the suburbs, it's near the big cities? Um, Robert Kiyosaki, I think you were at that event. He came and spoke to GoBundance a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And Kiyosaki gave great advice, and I will parrot it. And if you haven't read his book, Rich Dad Poor Dad, it's a great one. Um, Robert said that you want to invest in real estate, commercial, single family, multifamily, that's close to government buildings, hospitals, and schools. Because when there's an event like a pandemic that you never think is going to happen, those will be the entities that will continue to exist. Those people, doctors, nurses, teachers, and now there are teachers virtual, so that's an interesting one. Hospitals primarily, uh, those aren't going anywhere. Those are going to always stand. So I think those are good investments. Um, I've never been a big city person. I'm in Omaha. We do have a downtown, uh, but my investments are all in areas that get the highest um, uh, ratings for schools. So I track school ratings. So whatever schools are the best, I try to buy properties in those areas because that's typically your more fluent families and homes that are appreciating in value are typically in areas where the school ratings are the best. It's kind of the way that we've tracked it. Another st- yeah. strategy we implement is we look at what the dip, what the growth has been over the last 15 years for every property we hold. And we assume that if it grew X over 15 years, over the next 15, it'll grow Y. So slumlord mentality is our, our investors that are buying in depreciating areas, which typically you can cash flow really well on those deals, but you're not going to grow a legacy wealth with those deals. And so we pass on all slumlord property. So someone once told me $300 a month rent brings you $300 a month problems. Yeah. So Maybe anything under a thousand, we try to stay away from it. We want at least a minimum thousand month rent. I have some properties like that that are really low rent, and the and there is it is amazing because if you have somebody paying four or five hundred dollars a month and you have to evict them, it costs you the same four or five thousand dollars to fix the house up as it does if you're renting for two thousand a month. And so, or you have an HVAC system go out on a five hundred dollar a month house that costs you five or ten thousand to fix it, yeah. and if you're renting, you know, so you lose six months yeah. of rent or a year of rent. You know that article that talked about people leaving. You know, it, it, it talked about. You know, it says from Real Page that the you know rent collection in urban centers fell in June, while you know in sub, in the suburbs the revenue jumped twice as much. So it's the you know biggest gap they'd ever seen. Now it talked about mm-hmm. nightlife being the reason, but I think there's also something about you've seen all the articles with Twitter saying everybody can work at home now. Facebook says everybody works from home now. It's kind of permanent things. Dude. And in Austin, Texas, there's all these businesses that are saying work from home now. Like Aaron, your movie theater is at your home now. Your gym is at your home now. Your yoga studio is at your home now. Your swimming pool, your trampoline, all these things that we used to have to go somewhere else to do. Because of COVID, we've been forced to spend that money on making our homes better or buying new homes. And I think we're going to see huge backlash. That's why I called it the new norm. We'll never go back to what it was before. People have now been conditioned to feel comfortable. They've created habits because over 90 days has passed. And it's never going to be the same. I 
suspect that the traditional commercial space that houses offices is going to struggle. I think downtown landscapes are going to struggle because those commercial buildings are going to go away. So the restaurants and the support for those existing commercial buildings isn't going to be there and it's all going to be the demise. So the question now becomes, what can you place in those commercial spaces that offices are leaving that could be lucrative? And maybe yeah. we're going to convert those commercial buildings into multi. That's my yeah. guess is what we'll see happen. Yeah, solve that, right? Will it become, what, what, what will you do with that commercial stuff? This month in Texas, in the foreclosure postings, we have more retail centers posted for foreclosure than we've ever seen before, even considering the fact that our number of postings statewide is down like 30%. So we have, there's something like 1,400 total in Texas posted for foreclosure for August. Usually that's a five, six, seven thousand dollar a month thing. Of those, Here, here's my thing, and I won't I won't get on my political stage for a minute, though, Aaron, but I want to make a comment about it. All these businesses have closed because the US government chose to shut down their companies. So we all live in that country. I'm just gonna put that out there for everyone. To listen to this one more time. All of those businesses are filing for closure because the US government chose to shut down their companies. So because because of COVID. Not give people the option in a capitalistic society, but forced people to close down their business. It has been the, that has been the, one of the biggest eye openers of really, really successful businesses getting crushed. And the, and instead of saying, and saying, hey, people aren't responsible enough to make their own decisions. So, so they were going to do that. And wherever you guys fall politically, what Jeff is saying is true. If it wasn't for shutdowns, many of these businesses would still be uh, in business. You know, these retail centers that are getting shut down. It, highest, highest number of retail centers we've ever seen posted for foreclosure in August, even though it's a third of our normal posting well, count. The sad thing, and from a political standpoint, I don't, I'm not on either side. I'm, an, I'm anti-government in a lot of ways. And the thing that is, saddens me is a lot of very mid-sized businesses that don't make it to the news are the ones that are getting crushed right now. No one talks about them. Those are also the entities that don't get bailed out. And people will say, well, what about the PPP loans and all these other special loans? Those loans were designed to cover the cost of labor. If anyone understands anything about business on your P&L, your labor is only 10%. Who's covering the other 90%? Who's covering overhead expenses? Who's covering real estate? I, mean, I think one of the articles you had shared with me prior to this was talking about um, all of the leases that were getting broken. People weren't yeah. paying their leases because literally the news said, you don't have to pay your lease. Well, guess what? Guys like Aaron and I are the ones that own the properties that the government just gave permission to these people to not pay the lease. So how are we going to pay? We have to pay. That's the way it works. So somebody's on the hook. And if we don't pay, then the loan servicers have to pay. And if they don't pay, it's the American government that's backing all of this and who has the most to gain and who has the most to lose. It's just a scary, scary situation. So back to the house thing, if you haven't tracked this all the way up to this point in the importance of owning, it's not only owning, but it's how you own the property. So if you had one house, just to break the numbers down, Aaron, correct me if I get any of this wrong, but we pick up a door right now, let's say a $100,000 door in Omaha, we'll pick it up for $65,000. And we might put 5,000 into it. So now we're 70 in on a property that appraises at 100. We will cash flow on average 300 to $500 a month. And that's on a 20 year note. And rates are crazy low right now. We're under 5% on a 20 year note. And it adjusts, it's an amortized loan. Every five years, it readjusts based on prime. So, our goal over the course of 20 years is for that property to be paid off. Well, that $100,000 door in Omaha today rents at $1,000 a month. In 20 years, it'll be renting at $2,000 a month because we assume it'll double in value. So imagine if you just bought one property today and you paid full price because a lot of institutional investors will pay full price for multi today. Yeah. We'll even see over full price, right? So anyone listening that hasn't bought a house, that you buy it at market, as long as you can cash flow, which just means that you're able to make more per month than what you're spending on you know, your rent, your um, principal mortgage insurance and taxes, and then any other you know, vent, rent, uh, vacancy costs and any other unexpected expenses. If you're cash flowing and you, somebody else is going to pay this note off for you in 20 years from now, you could literally have a paid off property that's making you $2,000 a month. This is one house, $2,000 a month coming in. You just have a property management company. You pay 5% a month of whatever the rent is. And that's just one occurrence. So now take that by 10 and now take that by 10. So that's where Clint and I are right now at 100 doors. And you'd said you're in the hundreds. Our goal is to be in the thousands. But if you want to grow wealth really, really fast, it's figuring out how to do that as soon as possible before inflation hits. And you can, be, you can do something really special with 10 homes. Who wouldn't want 20 grand a month? If you own yeah. 10 homes today, over 20 years, they get paid off by somebody else. You'd be bringing in $20,000 a month on 10 houses paid off at 100 grand a house. 
Yeah, your legacy, your legacy is, is set at that point. It's like planting a tree, right? So I'll have some people that, that, you know, that they, they go through with me and they say, wait, the cash flow is only 300 a month. How do we ever make money at this? Right. And when Jeff is saying cash flows are 300, he's saying, you know, rent is a thousand mortgage is 500, you know, insurance is a hundred and property management is a hundred. So it's not that he's only renting it for a few hundred, but there's, he's saying that actual take home is 300. And I've had, you know, doctors and people that are investing say, well, that's not enough or that's not much. And, and, but what Jeff said there, it, it multiplies when your loan is paid off. It desperately multiplies every year. You get to raise rent while you're, you, know, you get to charge more in rent every year while your mortgage payment essentially goes down because of inflation, even though it stays the what? same, it's just your dollar. Dude, you the, mi- the, the Aaron, the mic drop, sorry to cut you off again. Um, the mic drop that a lot of people don't recognize in the Burr strategy is buy, renovate, rent, refinance repeat. Yep. And the refinance pieces where things get very special. So let's go back to my analogy of I buy the seven, the house for 65 that's worth 100 and I put five in. So I'll cash in now. I put a 25, 25% down payment on 65,000, which who wants to run the math on that really quick? It's 16 grand or something plus 5,000. Now I'm at 21,000 in. Within a year or two, I can refi my note. So instead of it appraising at 100, now it appraises at 125 and I can take all of that initial investment back and some as long as it's cash flowing 300 a month. And what my partner and I have done is instead of waiting the one to two years, we actually refi at closing. So if I can buy a property more than 25% below market based on a, a appraisal after repair appraisal, they'll give me a check at closing for the difference. And we have homes we buy at 50% below market and the bank is writing me a check for 25% of the value at that's, closing. And that's tax-free income. It's tax-free because you get a loan. So it's like re, anytime you refinance something and you cash out above, you get that. It's, it's, it's just it's, like pulling money in a home equity line of credit. Yeah. You get, that's you get your money, you get that money, but because you owe it, it's not, you know, and the, and the biggest mission, you know, the biggest message again, as we go into kind of these last pieces of news here is like, it's about if we didn't, if we haven't learned anything with the idea of these businesses that were successful getting shut down, it's to diversify. Is to diversify your income. And I would even say, like, as you look to the types of houses to invest in, you never know what you might have to diversify for. It might be neighborhoods. It might be cities. You know, the laws can change. Stuff can change where all of a sudden, so just don't put all of your eggs in one basket anymore. Yeah. You know, the, and Warren know, Buffett, who lives 10 miles from here, would say, you can put them all in one basket, just watch the basket. So I agree <laughs> with Aaron, though. Have multiple streams of income. Great book out there. Multiple streams of income will kind of speak to that. Aaron, if you don't mind, I'd love to invite anyone that's found value in the things I've shared today. If you'd please follow me on Instagram at Jeff M. Cohn. And then of course, go out to the Team Building Podcast. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube channel. You just search the Team Building Podcast, Jeff Cohn, C-O-H-N. How can my people follow you, Aaron? Yeah. And it's the same thing, right? So come find me at, at Instagram. So it's at Aaron and as you, as you type Aaron and then you get to like the AMU, it'll probably automatically find me. That's we have a, at RE Rockstars on Instagram and our you know real estate rockstars radio podcast, anywhere podcasts are and on Hyben digital. And that was, that was one of the big goals Jeff and I had today. I know we've, we've only got a couple more minutes. The very last thing, Jeff, before we, we jump off the, these three articles are so contradictory of each other. We've got Inman saying home prices continue to rise in May. We've got another Inman article says median existing home prices rise for hundredth consecutive month. And then I have a Bloomberg article saying home prices in us poised to slide following the surprising rally. And in this one, the core logic chief economist, so we've been talking about a lot of good news. We've seen a lot of good news. He says that- um, Not not speculative, just so we're all clear. We've seen factual data when it came out in May and even June numbers, factual data in most cities that the real estate market is up, the values are up and the inventory is down. So it's a strong real estate market, right? Factual yes. data. That's strong real estate market on actual data. Now the forecast, the chief economist at Core Logic, Frank Nothas, this just a couple of days ago, said, you know, there's a 75. And I guess when you put chances, 75 percent chance of price declines in 125 metro areas before next May, and he said prices in Las Vegas will plunge 20.1 percent as a plunge in tourism combines with values that were inflated. Mm. Man, I I think that is. No, I have no problem with that. In Vegas, I have no problem with that. Go to Kauai, go to any of the main islands, go to any of the resort destinations, Coronado, Hilton Head. It's it's a struggle right now because people are going to, I think they're going to file foreclosure. And this is a conversation I wanted to have is what are the, where can we find value? Or sorry, where can we find a strategic edge in the, our ability to acquire property from people that have 
had these challenges to rent the properties because of COVID. So I don't know that he's off on Vegas. Um, as far as saying it's going to be declining until next May, look at any charts. You look at Q1, Q2 typically always performs the best, Q3 is second best, Q4 third best, and Q1 is the worst. So he's just using analytics that it's always declining and yeah. it goes up and down throughout every year. Look at the market. So he's making a judgment based on the last 10 years data and that's accurate. Right yeah. after so, yeah, the summer, the, the, the market goes the down. Year. New Year's it goes down. It starts coming back up in March. People start going under contract March, April, May. They close over the summer because they want to move while the kids are in school or at college. So his he's not wrong. Yeah, it's a, but it, it, it sounded, and this is how this is how the media twists it. It sounds like it's going to plummet. He did give a percentage on just Vegas, but it is going to go down. Probably now through the end of the year, the market will go down because it does every year. That's that's the nature of Q1 through Q4. That is, that is the nature of it. And, you know, and so for the team building podcast listeners and the real estate radio listeners, hopefully today you guys got to hear a bunch of fun stuff. Obviously you guys can hear Jeff and I, we just love talking to each other. We love chatting. We love getting to talk about the news and, and see what's out there. And we get to see it from a lot of different perspectives, but we wanted to be able to challenge you today to look at the news a little different. You know, I had a guest on the podcast a while back that said, Hey, when you listen to the news, Look at it from all different angles. If you hear Tesla is opening a factory there, maybe it's trying to figure out who's going to supply Tesla or is there a new home neighborhood going on there or what stuff is nearby. Listen to the news to say, how does it affect you? But then also take it with a grain of salt. So that headline said, well, you know, home prices poised to crash after surprising rally. And the, and then, which isn't necessarily inaccurate, but Jeff is re-explaining that headline to go, yes, it's true, but there's a little bit different. So listen What's to the word out crash there. mean semantically and, I'd say too, Aaron, if I can piggyback on this topic, the people that are writing those articles are not as expert as you. The people that are writing those articles are getting paid by an institution that's capitalistic, that wants to turn a profit. Don't think that headline wasn't to get someone to click so that they could sell ads to other companies that are selling things to Aaron. Yeah. Every one of us, when we click on something, there we're only clicking because that business makes money by you putting your eyeballs on the next screen and go look at the ads that run on the next screen. They're probably going to be very similar to the things you've been talking about next to your cell phone over the last seven days. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I clicked. The headlines make me click. We look at them and we see what is really going on out there. And it's always really funny when you see three contradictory articles posted on the same yeah. same day and probably a lot of the same statistics. Well, again, Jeff, I've been, uh, I was so glad to be able to get you back on here. Real estate rock stars. If, if you like what Jeff is saying, go subscribe to the team building podcast. How often do you guys uh, do the podcast? It's twice a month or twice a week. I'm sorry. We usually will release one to two a week. Twice a week. That's our, and that's our schedule we're doing right now with the, with the Real Estate Rockstars radio as well. We're doing twice yep. a week. We were doing three times a week before everybody went home. And when people are driving less in their cars, they have less time to listen to podcasts. Yep. So 20, we keep them 25 minutes and they are intense, just like this one. We're into everything. There's no dialogue. There's no list of questions. People want authenticity, Aaron. I think that's what has made you so great. And that's what helped Pat Hyben have so much success with Real Estate um, Rockstars. And it's funny, I was a guest several times on Pat's show. That's actually how I got invited into abundance was through Pat interviewing me as a top yeah. agent. When I took my team, we went 70 to 240 sides in three years, then 70 to 700 sides in six years. And we listened to every real estate success podcast. And it literally, we took the blueprint from all the interviews Pat had had, as well as two or three other top podcasts. And that's how we constructed our team that grew to be the number one team in the world at Berkshire Hathaway in 2019. So for anybody out there that wants to know how to do it, listen to real estate rock stars. They're going to teach you step by step, go to all the way to the beginning and listen to them or go start now and then go backwards. But you guys do an amazing job. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. And the uh, you know Jeff teaches some of our classes on Rebus University, and the and on it, and you know he's obviously doing a lot of investing out there and teaching that too. So thanks again for listening, and the and we will see you guys next week. Thanks, Aaron. Bye. Rockstar Nation, thank you for listening to Real Estate Rockstars. Listen, I need a favor. If you find this free content helpful, if you find our downloadable items from each guest helpful, please. I need you to pull out your pointing finger. Yes, the one finger that points at people. 
and hit subscribe. Yes, subscribe. The more subscribers we get, the better we look in the ratings and the easier it is to get guests like Robert Kiyosaki, Barbara Corcoran, all the players that are on million dollar listing in the different cities. All that stuff makes it easier the more subscribers we get. So please subscribe. And listen, there's a lot of places you can leave comments. There's a lot of places you can like. We're on Facebook. We have an Instagram page. Instagram page is I am Pat Hyben. The Facebook is Real Estate Rockstars Radio. Feel free to leave us comments there. The most popular form of commenting seems to happen on YouTube. Yes, for whatever reason, it's a, a very open environment. So just go to YouTube and go to Real Estate Rockstars Radio. Leave us comments there. Some of them we will read on the show. We love your feedback. So thanks, guys, and I hope you are having a great day. Oh, and also, listen, if you're going to subscribe and you haven't already left a review on iTunes, please do that too. Have a great day and thanks so much, Rockstar Nation. I really appreciate you.